Missionary Christian Missionary Christianity A Muslim's Analysis Part 1 Supplying the missing information, clarifying the vagueness, and finishing the incomplete thoughts of the missionary Christian. Introduction Let there be no misunderstanding of our intentions. This booklet is not an assault on Christianity. Instead, we intend to clarify vagueness, supply neglected information, and finish incomplete thoughts found in the usual presentation of the Christian missionary. The Quran encourages the discussion of religious matters but according to a vital principle, both sides are supposed to discuss truth. Quran 3 hours 61 minutes If any one of the Christians disputes with you, O Messenger, regarding the matter of Jesus, and claims that he was not Allah's servant after the correct knowledge has come to you, then say to them. Come, let us call our sons and your sons, our women and your women, ourselves and yourselves, and let us gather together and then pray to Allah to send down his curse on those of us who are eyeing. Ali Imran, 61 Where the missionary has left matters vague or has hidden some information, or has not finished a thought the truth has not been presented. Since our goal is a careful analysis, let the reader consider his own response carefully. Any disagreement must be specified as a disagreement with something actually stated in the following material. It must also be said that nothing written here can be applied to all Christians. Christian belief covers a wide range. We are concerned with the style described in the first paragraph. Christian Objections Consider first some common Christian objections to Islam. The Christian points to corruption and bad behavior in so-called Muslim lands, he cites the warfare Muhammad waged, he denounces polygamy. In response, it must be said that bad Muslims condemn Islam only if bad Christians condemn Christianity, warfare disqualifies Muhammad as God's spokesman only if it also disqualifies Joshua. Polygamy condemns Islam only if it condemns Christianity. It is Christian culture, not the Christian religion, which has prohibited polygamy. In the Bible Paul has recommended monogamy for bishops and Jesus has spoken of the sanctity of the union but no Bible verse prohibits the practice. Most Christian objections are of this nature. They are the same kind of charges that national groups or political parties might make against each other. They are built on those things which one person dislikes about another person. The attacker does not ask the other man to justify his position. He simply announces his disgust. By contrast, a Muslim is concerned that the Christian should justify his position. Muslim Objections Christians say that God is immutable, i.e. unchanging. How then can it be said that he passed through the state of death? How could he grow in knowledge? Luke 2 verse 52 When we forgive a debt it means that we expect no payment. The Lord's Prayer asks God to forgive our debts the way we forgive our debtors. Why then does Jesus have to pay a price for our sins? The usual answers, the many paradoxes of a God-man, a being simultaneously mortal and immortal are said to be resolved by the phrase with God all things are possible. The debt of sin is explained as a misunderstood term so that the crucifixion was not so much a payment as a necessary demonstration of God's justice. Basic Point As will be shown, these responses illustrate the Christian difficulty. While he seems to respond to every question, there is no way to form an explanation consistent with all those things he has said. Instead, the total of the answers is a contradictory system. This fact is itself incorporated into the total. That is, where a logical investigation finds a conflict, this is covered over by insisting that the love of God is more important, doubt is a dangerous tendency. And these difficulties are divine mysteries. If a person is satisfied with this kind of rationale, no logical presentation is likely to change his mind. However, for those who would be motivated by exposure to facts, this booklet describes the situation in brief. If the Christian feels that a logical discussion is more than we should expect when considering religious matters, let him be encouraged by the biblical passage at Isaiah 1 verse 16. Come let us reason together. Demonstrating the point. Now consider the responses, the second then the first. The missionary is most concerned that the non-Christian take advantage of the ransom sacrifice of Jesus otherwise a man is lost. But this urgency is based on a price being paid. If we acknowledge that God is just, we do not need a demonstration of his justice. But the Christian insists that we must acknowledge the crucifixion itself, not God's justice, or be lost. Despite his answer, we are required to acknowledge a debt as paid not forgiven. 
Even though the phrase with God all things are possible are from the words of Jesus in the Bible, this proposition actually turns against Christian belief. It is self-destructive because it says that God can do ungodly things, act foolishly for example. It demolishes arguments where it is used. For example, Christian, the true nature of God is a trinity. Muslim, how can 1 plus 1 plus 1 is equal to 1? Christian, with God all things are possible. Muslim, then the trinity is not his nature, how he must be. It is an option. He could have been 3, 5, 9 or whatever. The pattern. These are two examples of the difficulties which we promise to expose. In general the pattern is this, a question is asked and an answer is given. But the answer conflicts with another article of faith or practice. So, in fact, the original question is not really answered because the response has not come from Christian belief. Instead it has come from something in conflict with Christian teaching. Explanation versus proof. There is a more basic issue than all that has been discussed so far. If we are only concerned with the analysis of explanations, we have skipped a point. The fact is, explanation is not proof. Ask a man why he believes something and he will usually respond by explaining his belief, not why it must be true. Whatever a missionary explains to a Muslim, our first question is really, where did you get your explanations? On this matter, the missionary almost always holds a minority view among Christians. The majority of Christians believe the same as Muslims regarding the Bible. The status of the Bible We believe that the Bible contains the words of God and other material besides. The fundamentalist Christian insists that all of the Bible comes from God, without error, at least in the original manuscripts. So the Muslim does not attack God's word. Rather, he rejects attributing the status of God's word to writings which do not qualify. In recent years the missionary has sometimes tried to fool the Muslim on this point. The Quran talks about the book of the Christian and Jews. The missionary has told us that this book is the Bible. An important QURANIC verse on the subject. In fact, the Quran refers to the authentic scriptures and the forgeries in their possession, see Quran 3 hours 77 minutes. Those who take a small amount of this world in exchange of Allah's advice to them to follow his revelation and his messengers, and in exchange of the oaths they took to fulfill Allah's pledge, will have no share in the reward of the afterlife. Allah will not speak kindly to them and will not look at them mercifully on the day of resurrection. They will receive a painful punishment. Almida, 77 At least one Quranic verse has been misquoted in missionary literature. By quoting the first half of Quran 548 they hope to convince Muslims that we must accept the total Bible. I sent down to you, O Messenger, the Quran with the truth about which there is no doubt that it is from Allah. I is a confirmation and guardian fo the revealed books that came before it. Whatever in those books conforms twice is the truth, and whatever does not is false. So judge between people according to what I have revealed to you in it and do not follow their desires which they have adopted in leaving the truth that has been revealed to you about which there is. No doubt. I have made a sacred law and clear path for every nation. If I willed to make all the laws one, I would have done so. But I made a separate law for every nation in order to test them all and to see who follows and who does not. So rush towards doing good actions and leave evil ones. Your return on the day of judgment is to me alone. I will inform you about that which you used to differ in and will repay you for the actions you did. Almida, 48. The verse in its entirety refers to the Quran as a confirmation of previous scriptures and a control. The word translated control is used to describe quality control in normal Arabic. This involves rejection of the disqualified. The Quran is called the criterion for judging the false and other scriptures, Quran 3 colon 3. He has revealed to you, O Prophet, the Quran with true stories and just laws that are in agreement with the previous divine books, and there is no contradiction between all these divine books. Before revealing the Quran to you, he revealed the Torah to Moses and the Gospel to Jesus. Ali Imrub, 3. Another verse which is complementary to those that charge forgery is, the verse which explains that the Quran will make clear much of that which Christians have concealed or passed over, Quran 5. 15. 
O people of the scripture referring to the Jews who had the Torah and the Christians who had the gospel, my messenger Muhammad, peace be upon him, has come to you to explain much of what you hide from the scripture revealed to you, and to overlook much of that in which there is no benefit besides disgracing you. The Quran has come to you as a book from Allah, which is a light to guide you and a book that makes clear all of what people regire for their worldly and religious affairs. Almida, 15. Some attempts have been made to prove the divine origin of the Bible. These fall into two categories, an appeal to accuracy and an appeal to miracles. In the first case we are given a number of historical or scientific points mentioned in Bible verses. What is left vague is why accurate statements should imply the work of God. The Bible makes contact with reality, but so do works of fiction. In fact, a man has to tell us some truth before he can lie to us. We do not mean to label the Bible as totally fictitious. But only to point out the weakness of an argument for divine origin of the Bible which is based on assorted accurate statements made in Bible verses. There are attempts made to dazzle us into belief by those who cite miracles performed by the Bible. For example, Ivan Panin spent 50 years writing over 43,000 pages investigating Bible numerics. There are, however, basic flaws in such an approach. First, Panin builds schemes around the numbers 7 and 11, and he the position value of letters and other devices. But the Bible does not state that these things have any relevance. Nowhere has God said, Behold the miracle of 7 and 11. Second, numerical miracles are cited especially in regard to their the Bible perfectly preserved accuracy. Yet the Bible also contains numerical inconsistencies. Various statistics in the biblical books of Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah are in conflict and this is excused as being only minor details which were lost over the years. Preservation of numbers is praised while the lack of preservation is excused. Third, the discoveries of these researchers tend to be self-reinforcing. For example, Pannon himself revised the New Testament based on his ideas. Where some text is faulty or doubtful, he decides on the basis of that which fits his scheme. One author of Theomatics maintained that the anonymous book of Hebrews was written by Paul because this would mean the total number of books in the Bible credited to Paul would then be equal to 14 a multiple of 7. And there is the miracle of personal experience, the Bible is true because it changed my life. Of course, any piece of literature is supposed to change the life of a thoughtful reader. To be fair, believers in the dazzling sort of miracle are less common than those who appeal on grounds resembling personal experience. In any case the miracles are unrelated to the conclusion that they are supposed to establish the divine origin of the entire Bible. Meanwhile, the appeal to accuracy is also an insufficient premise to establish this conclusion. What is the Bible? As it happens, the title Bible is a name not found in the Bible. Nowhere does the Bible name itself as a unit. Actually it is at least 66 separate writings which have been bound as one book. The earlier catalog of contents that agrees with the present text dates from the 4th century. This indicates that the Bible has no internal claim of unity. Of course, the writings speak of other writings, scriptures and books but not as the unit of today's collection. Almost the last verse in the Bible commands that nothing should be added to or subtracted from this book. While this has been quoted as a unifying statement, any Christian source will verify that the last book in the Bible was not the last book written. Thus the statement can only apply to this particular small book of the Bible 66. A missing claim. Nowhere does the Bible sum itself up as totally God's word. However, the missionary argument proceeds this way. At 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, Paul says that all scripture is inspired of God. In 2 Peter 3 verses 15 to 16, Peter says that Paul is correct because Paul too is a writer of scripture. Surely this is not supposed to convince anyone. Paul says so and Peter says he is right. This kind of argument would not satisfy us if we were investigating any matter. Moreover, we have Paul's denial of his own total inspiration at 1 Corinthians 7 verse 25. Here he states that he writes without God's inspiration on a subject. About one-third of the books in the Bible claim to be divine revelations while the others make no such comment. Because of this lack, the fundamentalist type of Christian has tried to find other justification for maintaining his claim, as mentioned above. A Christian Missionary's Thinking Questions 
article based on Gary Miller's speech on Islam and Christianity. Missionary, does the Quran say that Jesus was sinless? Muslim, yes. Jesus was perfect man. Never sinned. Missionary, does the Quran tell Muhammad to repent? Muslim, yes. Quran tells Muhammad to repent. That's all. The missionary doesn't say anything else. He hopes now that the Muslim would start thinking, now, wait a minute, Jesus never sinned, but Muhammad was supposed to repent. Maybe Jesus is better. Missionary wants the Muslim to start thinking that a sinless man is better than a repentant sinner. Missionary is hoping, but he dare not say it. Because if the missionary says that, he goes exactly against the teachings of Jesus. If the missionary is foolish enough to say that a sinless man is better than a repentant sinner, he's going against the teachings of Jesus. The reason why the missionary is going against the teachings of Jesus is this, story of a lost sheep. Matthew chapter 18, verse 12, Jesus said, If a man has a one hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine, on the hills, and go on the search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. Jesus was trying to hammer that point home to his disciples. Don't you dare say, for example, because you've been a faithful follower for many years that you're better than this one who just became a believer just yesterday. The perfect man has no precedence over the repentant sinner. Moments later. Missionary, was Jesus the Messiah? Muslim, yes. Missionary, was Muhammad the Messiah? Muslim, no. Now, the missionary stops there, and hopes that the Muslim would start thinking, now, wait a minute, Jesus is the Messiah, and Muhammad is not the Messiah. Maybe Jesus is better. What the Muslim should ask the missionary is about this word Messiah, Jesus was the Messiah, but were there any other messiahs besides Jesus? Now you find out how well he knows his Bible. Because there were many messiahs, David, Solomon, and even Cyrus, the Persian were called messiahs in the Bible. It's hard to find it in the Bible because the translators cover it over. Messiah means anointed. A messiah is someone who has been picked to do a job. Every king of ancient Israel was called messiah. Now the word doesn't sound so special anymore. It is a title, but it doesn't particularly elevate one to divine status. Moments later. Missionary, where's the body of Jesus? Muslim, God took it. Missionary, where's the body of Muhammad? Muslim, it's in Medina. It's buried in the ground. Now the missionary hopes that the Muslim would go away thinking, now that's interesting. The body of Jesus is gone, Muhammad is in the grave. Maybe Jesus is the true messenger, Muhammad is false. The missionary is hoping the thought would cross the Muslim's mind, but he dare not say it. What the Muslim should ask the missionary is this, do you mean that a dead and buried prophet is a false prophet? Is that what you mean? If that is so, what does missionary say about Abraham, for example? Abraham is buried. Jews and Muslims to this day still go to the place where Abraham is buried to visit his grave. Is Abraham a false prophet because he's dead and buried in the ground? The Bible also states body of Moses was taken up by God. God sent an angel to take the body away. Does this mean Jesus and Moses are equal in their divine status? What has the missionary's question proven?